For the first time in months, Nagato enjoys a dreamless sleep, having thoroughly exhausted himself during his time in the forest of death. When he awakens, the sun is high in the sky, and Yahiko's futon is empty, suggesting his friend is already awake. Stepping into the main room of Jiraiya's apartment, the young Uzumaki finds his friends and sensei enjoying a hearty breakfast, and when she sees him, Conan waves him over, smiling that it looks like he slept well. Returning her smile and taking his place between her and Yahiko, Nagato sighs that he really did, as Yahiko hands him a bowl of rice porridge, which after three days of questionable roots and giant centipede meat, smells like the most appetizing dish in the world. Jirai then explains that they were just discussing what to do with their prisoner, and this draws Nagato's attention away from their food, as he asks if she's alright. Chuckling, Yaiko lightly chides his best friend for worrying over a girl who not even three days ago tried to murder him for his eyes, but Nagato is unrepentant, repeating the question to his sensei, as well as asking if Nono's had breakfast yet. Smiling at this kind-hearted mentality, Jiraiya laughs that it must have slipped his mind, so if Nagato would like to bring her something to eat, he won't stop him. Thanking his sensei, Nagato rises to his feet, taking his own untouched bowl of food, and proceeding down the hall to the room Jiraiya had indicated while speaking of the girl. Truthfully, the Toad Sage is a little surprised even after all this time at the humility and humanity of this boy to not only feel compassion for an enemy but to empathize and to go without so that they don't have to suffer. If all people shared this mindset, perhaps the world truly would at last know peace. As Jiraiya watches Nagato's retreating back, he truly believes in that moment that one day they will, when this boy fulfills his destiny as the child of prophecy. Stepping into the small dark room with its curtains drawn, Nagato is assailed by sudden humidity and the fetid stench of an unwashed body, but he does not allow this to show in his face or tone, instead stepping into the centre of the room where a girl tied to a chair glowers up at him. In a pleasant tone, he wishes Nono a good morning, asking if she's hungry and proffering the bowl of porridge. However, the rude assassin spurns this offer, snarling she's not going to crack so easily just because he gives her food. Still smiling, Nagato says he knows that, since Jiraiya Sensei told him about the seal on her tongue, so he's not going to try and interrogate her. He just wants to talk and get to know her a bit better. This pleasant demeanor is met by suspicion, with Nona's eyes darting between the door and window while her lips remain pursed, a fact which disappoints Nagato, but all the same, he offers her a spoonful of porridge. When this too is rebuffed, he just smiles that perhaps she'll feel like it later, laying it aside and beginning to talk, mostly about trivial things, but also sharing some personal details about himself as one would with a new friend. This continues for some time, until eventually Conan comes in to fetch her friend, saying Jiraiya Sensei wants to talk to them. Rising to his feet, Nagato gives Nono one last smile, promising to come back soon, and urging her to call out if she needs anything. There is no irony or cruelty to these words, and as the redhead departs, Nono is left with that same feeling of conflict she experienced back in the forest of death. Back in the main room, Jiraiya calls over Nagato and Conan to join him and Yahiko, saying that it's time they discuss their training for the final round of the Chunin exams. Being such a public event, it would be the ideal place for their covert enemy to attempt to assassinate Nagato under the guise of an accident, or else capture one of the other two, in the hopes of inducing him to trade his eyes for their lives. For that reason, he's enlisted specialist teachers for each of them to help them grow their individual strengths over the next month, so that when they step into that arena, they're as best prepared as they can possibly be be. Nodding, the three Genin ask who their sensei has chosen for them, and grinning, he replies that he had to pull some strings for this first one, but Conan will be studying under Hiruzen, since if anyone knows how to develop a whole new form of ninjutsu, it's him. Conan is a little surprised by having such a high-profile teacher, figuring Jiraiya Sensei would reserve that for Nagato, and so modestly thanks him, while Yahiko claps her on the back, and Nagato smiles that he's certain she will grow immensely under Lord Third. Next up is Yahiko, who will be training with Sakamo Harake, with Jiraiya claiming the White Fang is quite excited to be a teacher, since he was impressed with Yahiko during their mission. Yahiko seems a little disappointed not to be training with Jiraiya, but the Toad Sage gives his orange haired protege an encouraging smile, telling him that this will be good for him, since while he is flattered how closely Yahiko has based his style on him, the boy needs to find his own path, since that's the only way he can truly surpass his mentor and become the great shinobi Jiraiya knows he can be. At this last statement, tears swim in Yahiko's eyes, which he vigorously wipes away, trying to act tough, while promising his sensei that he will make full use of Sakamo's training. 
Finally, there is Nagato, and with a chuckle, Jiraiya opens by saying that he suspects Nagato isn't going to be thrilled with his choice, but he wants the young Uzumaki to hear him out. Nagato nods, and so Jiraiya reveals that he has arranged for Nagato to spend the next month training under Orochimaru. At once, the mood in the room shifts, with Conan taking a sharp intake of breath, while Yahiko roars that Jiraiya Sensei can't leave Nagato alone with the creepy snake guy, quickly offering to swap spots with his friends and let Nagato train with Sakamo instead. The only one who doesn't react is Nagato, who stays perfectly still, his eyes locked firmly on Jiraiya. When Yaiko has ceased his tirade, the Toad Sage suggests that perhaps they should ask Nagato himself how he feels about this. And without hesitancy, the boy replies that he can see how much Jiraiya Sensei trusts this man, so he shall try to do the same. Understanding the true gravity of this statement, Jiraiya gives his student an appreciative nod before continuing that he's been trying to help Nagato master his Rinnegan, but truth of the matter is he doesn't know the first thing about being a prodigy, so he's just been fumbling around in the dark trying not to screw up. That's not how things are with Orochimaru though. His fellow Sanin is a natural genius just like Nagato, and with his vast pool of knowledge, he might actually be the one who can help him tap into his powers. Nodding his understanding, Nagato says that he won't let his sensei down, then has won the trio rise, departing at last to begin their separate training. Due to the Hokage's office being the closest destination, Conan is the first to arrive, knocking on Lord Third's door and waiting to be let in. When she enters, Hiruzen greets her warmly, saying that he's very much looking forward to getting her help over the next month, a claim which confuses the girl, as she thought he was meant to be helping her. Nonetheless, Hiruzen presses on, saying that with her paper ninjutsu she will be a great asset around the office, pointing out the stacks of papers piled high on his desk. Not wanting to cause trouble, Conan asks how she can help, with Hiruzen approvingly telling telling her that her first task will be to send a notice to every house in the village. Knowing that this would take days to do by foot, Conan takes the first notice and folds it into an origami butterfly, before imbuing it with her chakra and having it fly out the window, a feat which the Hokage applauds, encouraging her to keep it up, while also suggesting the work may go faster if she employs a few of those paper clones Jiraiya was telling him about. Nodding, Conan begins gathering up assorted waste paper from across the room, as well as pulling a few sheets from her collection of origami paper, and using it to manifest a pair of solid doppelgangers, who join her in collecting the notices and sending them out as butterflies. Smiling, Hiruzen watches the girl work, pleased to see that his former apprentice was right both about her creative approach to problem solving and her precise chakra control. All she needs now is a teacher to help her adapt the underlying principles, and with a month to guide her, Hiruzen is confident that he can be that teacher. Meanwhile, Yahiko has made his way to the training field where Sakamo Harake is waiting for him. Having patched things up after the incident at the Hidden Sand Tower, the boy greets his new teacher in a friendly manner, with Sakamo smiling and telling Yahiko that he hopes he's ready for a month of intense training. Yahiko grins that he sure is, taking his fighting stance and drawing his blade. Having lost his original Tonto during the battle with and subsequent escape from Nono, this sword is hers, having been claimed as a spoil of battle after her capture. Though due to both being standard issue root Tantos, there is practically no difference. However, when Sakamo looks at the weapon, it is with a definite frown. A little worried, Yahiko asks the White Fang what's wrong, with Sakamo stating that what the boy has there is a Tanto blade. He then adds with a slightly teasing tone that what the Tanto is best suited for is attacking with finesse and precision, and pardon his saying so, but neither are Yahiko's strengths. He then deftly pulls the sword from his student's hand and adopts a stance very similar to the one Nono did in their battle, couching the blade and thrusting at Yahiko's head. Leaping back with a yelp, Yahiko witnesses as Sakamo impales a wasp that was about to sting the boy's ear with the tip of his blade, the move so precise that the bug remains for the most part intact. Grinning, Yaiko calls this awesome, imploring Sakamo to show him how to do that, but the white-haired man shakes his head, saying he thinks Yaiko is missing his point. While he could spend the month teaching him the nature of precise blade work, it would be a disservice to the boy, since Yaiko would still be but a novice, while his contemporaries would be growing more proficient with their strengths. A better use of their time together would be to identify Yaiko's true strengths and help him improve upon them. Curiously, Yaiko asks if Sakamo has any idea what that strength is, and with a thumbs up, the White Fang replies that he is more than an idea, he's got Yahiko all figured out. Yahiko's greatest strength is his fearlessness, having seen it both in the way the boy ran headlong into battle to protect Conan, as well as his willingness to call out Sakamo himself when he was being an idiot, despite him being his commanding officer at the time. That sort of guts can be harnessed into incredible power, and if Yahiko will let him, he'd like to teach him how to harness it.
Nagato's rendezvous point is far less auspicious than his teammates, having been instructed to wait for Orochimaru in an isolated forested area on the outskirts of the village. With the thickness of the trees, the sun is largely hidden from view, and Nagato can't help but think that if the Snake Sun intended to make good in a suggestion of murdering him from their first encounter, this would be the place to do it. Thankfully, it seems Orochimaru has other ideas, as when he approaches, it is with only a slightly sinister smile on his pale lips. Surveying Nagato like a lab specimen, the Sunin doesn't bother with a greeting, instead telling the boy that they don't have time to waste, since he only has him for a month, and there are many tests to run. A little perturbed, Nagato says he thought they were training for the Chunin exam finals, but Orochimaru smiles, or perhaps smirks would be more accurate, that the boy should consider the possibility that a single act can have more than a single outcome. Their work together should not only assist in Nagato's development, but also help him answer a question that has plagued him his entire life. Still a bit hesitant of the Snake Man in spite of what he said to Jiraiya-sensei, Nagato asks what question that is, his turn suggesting that if they are to be working together it must be as partners, not as scientist and guinea pig. Arching his thin brows slightly, Orochimaru replies in a tone that sounds almost like he is impressed with the boy, saying that what he seeks is the key to eternal life. Though he doesn't want to admit it, Nagato can certainly understand the desire, especially if he could gift it to those he loves as well and never lose them. However, he cannot fathom how his presence could help Orochimaru in this quest, and so asks the older man. This elicits an amused sound from the snake Sanin, who responds that it should be obvious, Nagato's Rinnegan. Due to possessing those eyes, Jiraiya believes the boy to be the reincarnation of the Sage of Six Paths, a most fascinating revelation if true, since it would mean that with sufficient power, a person can transcend death and return to the land of the living. A little bashfully, Nagato admits that he isn't so sure, calling Jiraiya Sensei's theory just that, a theory. However, this just makes Orochimaru's smirk grow, as he replies that this is the purpose of their tests, to ascertain the truth or lack thereof in regards to his old teammate's speculation. Still not fully on board, Nagato poses two more questions. First, how? And second, how will this help him develop like Orochimaru said? To this, Orochimaru only needs one answer, saying that they're going to work on granting Nagato the ability to access one or more of the Six Paths' powers at will, since if he can do so as the Sage of Six Paths once did, then that will be the first trace of evidence in favour of Jiraiya's theory. Trying not to sound rude or contrarian, Nagato tells the Snake Sage that while he does want to learn to harness the power of his Rinnegan at will, he's already been trying to do that with Jiraiya Sensei for months, and they haven't been able to achieve anything. With another hint of Rai amusement, Orochimaru replies that that is because they have been doing things Jiraiya's way. His training methods are vastly different from the Toad Sage's, and as Nagato will soon learn, he has a way of getting what he wants from his subjects. And so the month of training begins, with Nagato, Yaiko, and Konan each working hard under their respective masters. Each morning the trio rise bright and early to meet their mentors, and it is often not until late in the evening that all three make it back home. Due to the rigors of this training, the kids seldom have enough energy for more than a quiet meal and then bed, though Nagato does make a point to bring Nono dinner every night and spend a bit of time chatting with her, even if it's just talking about his day. Being a prisoner, Nono refuses to reciprocate this affection, Though with time she does learn to tolerate Nagato's presence, the hatefulness of her glare lessening ever so slightly with each visit. Their bond, as it were, only grows when after days of refusing food or drink, Nono finds herself on the verge of death. Being a trained rude assassin, she is prepared to meet this fate, but Nagato refuses, giving her food and water, and staying up the remainder of the night to ensure she will be okay. When she opens her eyes, she is surprised to see the red-headed boy watching over her, and oddest of all, smiling as though the sight of her awake makes him happier than anything else in the world could. Furiously, Nono demands to know why the hell he saved her when they're enemies, but with an even bigger smile, Nagato replies that he doesn't see them that way. It's like he said before, he wants to be her friend and help her, since though she may not believe it, she is a victim of their unnamed enemy just as much as he is. From here, Nono slowly begins to engage a little more with Nagato, though never touching on the topic of her mysterious master, or any details regarding why she was sent to take the boy's eyes. In turn, Nagato never asks, instead wanting to know more about Nono's interests and her hopes for the future. Even getting this much out of the girl is difficult, with her claiming that she has no hopes, and that she killed her heart long ago. Though Nagato doesn't believe this, remembering the tears he saw in her eyes in the forest. Nono does however open up a little bit about her history, showing that she too was an orphan who was taken in and trained in the shinobi arts, and for that reason she holds no grudge against Jiraiya or the Rain Trio, since this is simply their way of life. Nagato appreciates this, saying that when the whole ordeal is over, he's sure Jiraiya 
since they would be happy to make her a part of their family as well, a claim which seems to trouble Nono, though like with most matters, she holds her tongue and keeps her thoughts to herself. Wanting to prove the sincerity of these words, Nagato goes to Jiraiya and requests that Nono be untied and allowed to move freely around the apartment, an idea which the Toad Sage is understandably not too keen on, pointing out that more likely than not, the second he unties her, she'll try to rip his eyes out again. Smiling, Nagato says he doesn't think she will, admitting he trusts her and truly believes they understand each other. Remembering his hope from the morning after Nagato returned from the Forest of Death, Jiraiya acquiesces, untying Nono and informing her of the conditions of her release. Though he does make a point to mention it would be pretty dumb for her to try and escape, since if what she told the kids in the forest is true, her allies will probably kill her the second she leaves the apartment. Begrudgingly, Nono accepts these terms, and so slowly begins to integrate into the found family's lives, silently helping with chores and joining them for meals, even if she prefers to eat alone in the corner. Yaiko and Conan are still suspicious of her, with Conan feeling a level of personal betrayal at the other girl's attempt to manipulate her, but putting their faith in Nagato, they treat their guest pleasantly, if not necessarily warmly. While Jiraiya remains vigilant as ever, ready to act at a moment's notice if this girl makes a move to hurt his kids. Despite the somewhat tense dynamic, Nagato is happy to watch Nono's rehabilitation, and the time he spends with her and his family become the high point of his days. Admittedly, this is not a particularly high bar to clear, as what Orochimaru calls training, others would call torture. Much of the Snake Sunnian's training regimen is comprised of seeking shadow clones on Nagato, and forcing him to use the Predator Path to absorb the barrage of jutsus they hurl at him, having decided that since this is the first path Nagato used, it is theoretically the one he should have the easiest time activating again. It is a cruel, painful, and inhumane way to train, but like it or not, it is effective. With Nagato's survival instincts allowing him to tap into the Six Paths' power just enough to save his life, and being a scientist, Orochimaru is there to document everything, from what level of danger the boy needs to be in to draw out his power, to what Nagato's mental state is at the moment of activation. Through this he is able to develop more and more precise tests that allow Nagato to narrow down the best way to trigger his predator path, with the pair soon concluding that the Rinnegan's power does not require a life or death situation merely for Nagato to manifest it through his will. Unfortunately, even this cannot be simple, as when Nagato tries to will himself to use the Deva path like he did in the Hidden Sand base, he finds himself unable to do so, suggesting that even as he gains proficiency with the Predator path, the other five remain shrouded in mystery. By now their allotted month of training is drawing to a close, and so figuring that the purpose of this month is to acquire and hone a specialization like Jiraiya said, Nagato suggests they should remain focused on mastering the Predator path, rather than trying to branch out. An idea the Snake Sunin is not initially agreeable on, with him having wanted to see all six paths for himself. However, being a man of logic, he hears his subject's proposition out, with Nagato reasoning that a well-honed predator path will not only help gauge the extent of a Rinnegan Jutsu's strength, but will also be the most useful path in the finals, which as he points out is why he's doing these tests in the first place. Reluctantly, Orochimaru accepts this premise and acquiesces to the plan, little knowing that Nagato has another reason entirely to want greater control of that particular path. Meanwhile, Conan and Yahiko's trainings are also beginning to bear fruit, with Yahiko having learned a few close-range jutsu that supplement his speed and taijutsu, while also beginning to work on a new jutsu of his own under the watchful eye of Sakamo. Conan's success is a less combat-based, at least upon first glance, as she has completely optimized the Hokage's filing system through her paper ninjutsu, as well as create effective inter-office memos thanks to her origami butterflies. It is through these two successes, and a little unseen prodding from Hiruzen, that Conan is able to come up with an idea to create paper wings for herself, since flight would vastly increase the space in which she could move, while giving her a distinct advantage against those ill-equipped to fight at range. Hiruzen praises this idea, and even assists Conan in bringing it to life with his vast stores of knowledge, truly earning his epithet of the Professor. He also assists her in combining jutsu such as her wings with paper shurikens, to create a long-range method of attack which will allow her to protect herself from those who are skilled at distance fighting, granting a well-rounded offense and defense. Finally, the month of training comes to an end, and the day of the Chunin exam finals arrives. Nagato, Yahiko, and Conan each feel ready to show off all they have worked to achieve, though before they step foot in the arena, Jiraiya pulls them all aside, sagely warning them all to watch out for any sort of trap laid by their enemy, citing their relative inactivity over the last month as a cause of concern. The trio of Genin all promise to be careful, and with determined looks on their faces, enter the arena. 
The first match of the day is slated to be Yahiko vs Conan, however here the audience are disappointed as when both step onto the field, Yahiko makes a shocking declaration that he forfeits. From the Hokage's box, here is an Ask the Orange Head Lad why he's doing this, to which Yahiko replies that he's thought long and hard about it and he's not going to fight and hurt one of his best friends, even if that means he doesn't get to become a Chunin. Giving the boy a piercing look, here is an Ask if Yahiko is sure since he runs the risk of falling behind his friends if he makes this choice. Turning his chin out in a sign of stubborn determination, Yahiko says that he is. He then turns his back on the audience and heads for the exit, stopping only to encourage Conan to make it all the way to the finals for both of them. Next up is Fugaku vs Inoichi, and it is almost as short as Yaiko and Conan's match, as before the Yamanaka boy can act, the flashing red of Fugaku's Sharingan place him under Genjutsu, from which he cannot escape, allowing the Uchiha to casually stroll over and place a kunai to Inoichi's neck, securing the victory. Finally it is time for Nagato to face Choza Akamichi, with Choza proving himself to be a burly young man who towers over his skinny opponent. However in spite of his smaller stature, Nagato is faster, a crucial trait in this fight, as with what he has planned and he who strikes first will surely win. And fortunately for Nagato, this is him, as when Choza goes to perform the ram hand seal, he's able to grab hold of the other boy's wrist with both hands. For a moment, nothing happens, but this is exactly in accordance with Nagato's plan, as Choza is forced to realize that something is siphoning his chakra. Solemnly the Rain Boy explains that this is one of his six paths powers, which allows him to absorb chakra, and so as long as he is touching Choza, the Rotund Boy will be unable to use chakra without it getting drawn to him instead. Unfortunately for Nagato, this does not inspire the other boy to forfeit as he had hoped, but instead to hit him as hard as he can with his free hand, trying to dislodge the little squirt and regain full usage of his chakra. Between the fact that Choza is using his offhand and the fatigue from having his truck rapidly depleted, this punch is not as powerful as it could have been, but all the same, blood spurts from Nagato's nose and causes him to briefly see stars. Thankfully the bigger boy is not given a chance to throw a second hit, as by now he is feeling quite woozy from the chakra depletion, and before he can ball his fist up again, Choza falls backwards with a heavy thump, having been rendered unconscious. And just like that, Nagato has made it to the second round alongside Konan and Fugaku, with both congratulating the young redhead, while Nagato himself approaches Choza after he awakens, thanking him for helping him confirm that his training has really paid off, and he can truly access the Predator path at will. Soon after this, the last semi-finalist is decided, with it being Shikaku Nara. However, upon seeing who he is slayed to fight, he hastily withdraws, saying he isn't stupid enough to go up against a guy with the eyes of a god. As a result, Nagato is immediately advanced to the finals, while Konan and Fugaku Square off for the chance to join him there. Up in the stands, Jiraiya and Yahiko cheer Konan on as she re-enters the battlefield, though this time she comes equipped with something neither of them have ever seen before, wings made of hundreds of pieces of origami paper. On the proctor's order to start, Konan takes to the air with impressive speed, hurling a volley of paper shurikens down at Fugaku. Deftly, the Uchiha boy employs a fireball jutsu to burn these older cinders, though to his surprise when the fire makes contact, the shurikens detonate, revealing themselves to have been made of paper bombs. The force of this chain reaction is enough to knock Fugaku off his feet, and this is just the opening Conan is looking for, detaching her wings and dropping back down to the ground, as on either side of her the wings become a pair of paper clones with kunai drawn. The trio of Conans then point their blades at their downed foe, ordering him to yield, but the future Uchiha clan head has other plans it seems, breathing fire at the Conans in an attempt to incinerate the clones and stun the real one. Making the hand sign to release the clones, Conan calls the paper that made them back to herself as wings to prevent them from being burned away, and this gives Fugaku a vital piece of information. Conan only has a finite paper supply, if he can get rid of it, she will be vulnerable. This immediately becomes his new objective, spitting fireballs in rapid succession in the hope of catching Conan's wings. Thankfully the clever girl is able to avoid this by returning to the sky and reaching an altitude beyond the range of his attacks. From here she is able to safely rain paper shurikens down on Fugaku, and not wanting to fall for the explosive tag trick again, the young man simply responds by knocking away those that get near with a pair of kunai. This creates a stalemate, or well, so it would seem, as after a few volleys of paper shurikens, Conan is able to achieve her true objective, forming the scattered papers into a clone directly behind Fugaku, who lays a blade to his throat before he can act. With both hands full, and no way to turn and breathe fire on this clone before she can stab him in the neck, it seems the defeat is truly inevitable for Fugaku. The young Uchiha even tells his opponent as much, saying this well-planned strategy could defeat anyone, except him that is, since he has an ability beyond that of even the most powerful living Uchiha. A gift not seen since the days of Madara, born of the horrors of this war, behold his wicked eye. 
At once, Fugaku's Sharingan begins to change shape, with curved lines shooting out from the pupil while blood runs down his cheek. And as these new eyes gaze fall upon the paper clone's wrist, she bursts into flames. But not just any flames, these are pitch black. The clone's immolation is so instantaneous that Conan cannot even recover the paper, and as the Uchiha boy looks up at her, the tips of her wings also catch alight with these black flames. Calmly, Fugaku tells her that Amaterasu is an unstoppable flame that will burn until its target is less than ash. So she has two choices, burn to death or release her wings, and he will catch her, though when he does, it will mean the end of their battle. Being level-headed enough to know that promotion is not worth dying over, Conan detaches from her wings and drops into Fugaku's waiting arms. As expected, he immediately lays a kunai against her throat, and with a silent nod, Conan acknowledges his victory, forfeiting the fight. As the crowd applauds, Conan returns to her feet, while Fugaku offers her a hand to shake, repeating his praise that her strategy would have defeated anyone but him, as well as adding that she pushed him to reveal the secret of his Mangekyo Sharingan, a feat no ordinary ninja could have been capable of. Smiling, Conan thanks him, accepting the handshake, while ignoring the distant sound of Yaiko screaming that Fugaku is a dirty cheat for using weird colored fire. After a brief intermission in which Nagato congratulates Conan, and is in turn wished luck by her for the final match, Fugaku and Nagato take their places on the field. Unlike Conan, Fugaku doesn't wait in this battle, having already ascertained enough about Nagato to immediately go on the attack. Knowing that ninjutsu and genjutsu are all but useless against the Rinnegan, the older boy decides to rely on Uchiha's specialty, Shuriken Jutsu, as the fight with Choza has already proved that when hit, Nagato will bleed. However, as Fugaku is about to find out, the Rinnegan's perception is not to be tried with. As drawing a pair of kunai, Nagato is able to deflect his assault before rushing in, hoping to end things quickly like he did in his first match. Refusing to allow himself to go down so easily, Fugaku tests the theory, dropping a smoke bomb and darting slightly to the side. A moment later, Nagato emerges from where Fugaku was rather than where he should have been, and this tells the young Uchiha all he needs to know, that there are ways to obscure the Rinnegan's vision. Dropping another smoke bomb, Fugaku now rushes in, hoping to make use of hit and run taijutsu to clinch the match in his favor. However, the younger boy is not out of tricks either, using Fugaku's own fire breathing to form a protective circle of flame around himself and force Fugaku back. As a result, Fugaku reverts to his original plan of throwing weapons, and unfortunately for Nagato, he has grown dependent on his perfect vision, meaning that without it, he is able to be struck with a few of these. Or rather, his shadow clone is. And as the doppelganger pops out of existence, the real Nagato emerges. Having used Nono's camouflage jutsu in the cover of the first smoke bomb to stay hidden, or relying on Fugaku's single minded desire to end things to keep him from searching for signs of deception. Cursing himself for falling for the oldest trick in the shinobi book, Fugaku retreats, belching a fireball at Nagato as he goes. The young redhead easily manifests the bubble around himself which absorbs the attack, but this provides Fugaku with valuable albeit unwelcome information. Nagato wasn't bluffing about absorbing any chakra sent his way. It was unlikely that he would be, but after that sneak attack, he wasn't about to take anything on face value. Weighing his options, Fugaku has to admit that things don't look great. Ninjutsu will be consumed by the Rinnegan, Shuriken Jutsu can be deflected, and Taijutsu runs the risk of Nagato grabbing him and knocking him out like Choza. But then it hits him, something about Nagato's fighting style that he didn't notice until replaying all the boy's actions back in his head, Nagato isn't fighting back. Throughout both his battles, he has not made a single offensive maneuver, having painlessly defeated Choza and only drawn weapons and used ninjutsu in their fight as a defense mechanism. Even now, when his opponent is retreating, Nagato hasn't made any move to attack, instead choosing to enter taijutsu range, an area of ninja combat his Rinnegan gives him no protection from so that he can grapple Fugaku and absorb his chakra, thus taking him out in a single blow. It is a noble intention, but in the shinobi world, such intentions seldom end well. Calling out to Nagato, Fugaku informs him that he's figured out his plan before encouraging him to give up on this pacifistic approach. However, there is no scorn or condemnation in his tone as he says this. Instead, Fugaku addresses his young opponent with the utmost respect, his message clearly coming from a desire to see Nagato survive. Recognizing this, Nagato thanks Fugaku, though declares that to abandon this style would be to go back on his ninja way, and that is something he cannot do. So even if it costs him his life, he will never allow his actions to further the cycle of violence and hate. Hatred. Such passion from the normally quiet Nagato drives the air from Fugaku's lungs. This feeling, it is as powerful as the killing intent he has felt on the battlefield, but there is no malice to it. It is pure and bright like a ray of sunlight, and as one does when staring directly into the sun, Fugaku is briefly blinded, allowing Nagato to close the distance and grab hold of his hand. At once the Uchiha boy feels his chakra being depleted, and though he could probably break free with his kunai and prolong their fight, he finds that he doesn't want to, instead twisting his caught hand to form the unison 
sign with Nagato, as with a smile, he congratulates him on his victory. All around the two boys, the crowd applauds, and it is with great pride in his voice that Hiruzen calls an end to the tuning exams. Following this, Nagato reunites with Konan, Yaiko, and Jiraiya, the latter of whom is especially proud of his student, for sticking to his convictions. He then offers to take them all out for dinner, but with a serious look, Nagato says there's one thing he has to do back home first. Not sure what's on the boy's mind, but recognizing the severity of his tone, Jiraiya gives his blessing, telling Nagato to meet them at the ramen place when he's done. The family of four then go their separate ways, with Nagato leaping from rooftop to rooftop so they can get back to Jiraiya's apartment as soon as he can. Entering through the window, Nagato makes straight for his destination, Nono's room. In an attempt to make her a bit more comfortable, Jiraiya has provided a futon and some basic amenities, but it is still a fairly spartan sight that meets his eye when Nono lets him in. Spotting his resolute expression, which is so unlike his usual kind look, the girl feels compelled to ask what happened, and in a soft voice, Nagato replies that he thinks he knows how to help her now, he just needs her to please open her mouth. Having on some subconscious level grown to trust him, Nono complies, and as she does this, the boy extends a hand, laying it across the lower half of her face. On instinct, Nono goes to snap at him and demand he stop whatever this is, but before she can make a sound, she feels a slight itchiness on the back of her tongue. Seeing this in her eyes, Nagato retracts his hand, then with a smile says that if his theory is correct, her seal should be gone, meaning that she is finally free of whatever hold her mysterious master has on her. Truthfully, Nono cannot believe it, having accepted long ago that she would be bound to the root until she died. But as she looks into those odd purple eyes that she was sent to steal, the eyes of a boy who despite having every reason not to, has treated her with more compassion than anyone she has ever known, she wants to believe him. And so taking a shaky breath, she begins to utter words that she should not be physically capable of. Danzo Shimura, the man who sent me after you, is Danzo Shimura. And that's where we'll leave things for now. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.